salone, ibo na je, ang ezeli mali macho, ang ezelu ju, umalu fale le mina, umalu fale le basela, umasi lolo, umago wa soma, ya me sabu kuluku, ang ataba na na mumwe, masempulu tu mshabe, kilesi zacho mina. Lutate, lutate, jeho Tata lo kutu Tatu wa shina lo choba Olo akoba Ina nipuni mali macho Bebo nagele mpilwe Bebo shagele basalwan Kimi bebo nagele basalwan Bebo nagele Kimi bebo shagele basalwan Bebfile basalwan Wangye zelu musa yeche Ola basalwan Ile se za jomina Oh my daughter Ingalu 
Kasa kutu mama Ibo na jen Mina, Mina, 
zizacho ni mbona nje anyifunu tumo awoto mi ni lesi zacho ni mbona nje anyifunu tumo au baba mi au lesi zacho ni mbona nje anyifunu tu memhlabe ngoto mi ni lesi zacho ni mbona nje anyifunu mina bazalwane au mina bana mina bazalwane ibona nje mina bazalwane au shele bana ilesi zacho mina mina bazalwane ibona nje mina bazalwane ibona ntabene anyifuni mana anyezelu tu ilesi zacho mina Mama Kupa 
mukurunga hakuna 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 kupi da Jesu ha kuna ha kuchina iko ha. A very good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Let me take this opportunity to greet you all. And we thank you for being connected. We welcome you to our afternoon service. Today is the crucifixion day. So you are welcomed to the reflections and revelation that the man of God has brought to us. And soon after the crucifixion service, we'll go straight into our service for the seven words of Jesus Christ on the cross and seven preachers has been lined up and the Lord will be speaking to us. Remember to like our page and share. Those who are willing to partner with us, remember to make use of our echo cache number and also to get in touch with uh, Reverend Simango, the communications officer, and also getting in touch with our mission secretary, Mr. Chagovo, and our missions director. Your comments are still being welcomed. For content, get in touch with our evangelism coordinator, Reverend D. Maturi, and for technical issues, get in touch with Reverend Smango again. Stay connected and stay blessed. I'll take you through straight to our service. God bless you.
observation our Easter service. Today we want to take time and remind each other as was encouraged by the head of the church that we should take days of separating ourselves under physical lockdown but not spiritually locked down. Tichinama tira kereke, tichinama tira denda rakabata pasugose, tichinama tira utunga miri, tichinama tira vare vila pita vasa behind the scenes, maruku lengo wa titresa kana. Eka ito le mkana unu kutitinama ati. Tino kutenda iba wa mstara jesu, kakare tawe pano masikate anu, atiri kuya pa mbeku chikaro chenye nche nyasha, tichitaka nyasha zenyo mwari. Tunozi wangu tumatisita panu nukuda kwenye ashatini. Mkati mengu wa hilo kristu ya tunorangani na kutisua ya tinakufanira. Asuma katifanire sa nilopa ni mchinji kwa. Tinonyenge terira uwepo wei. Pase bisi ino ito pinda. Patino suma babano kunzu kwa kutawu na kuwa matuma kwa suara nasi. Nyasha zenyu nga zitike kwa tiri. Mbili izore ya kwa mbili. Tanama ata baba, musitara baba, manakomana na mweyane. Our Lord's prayer together. Baba we in Wari Kudenga, Gari Matwe na Uchene Stare, Umambo wenyu nga uwe, Kuda kwenyu nga kuitupe panyika, So Kudenga. Mutire gerira ya shudari kose, Kufana na nisu, Tinore gerira ha, Vanu tisatisira isu. Regae kutupinza kwa kuyetu, Asimuni tinunuwe kwa kuyima, Nukuti umambo nde wenyu, Nesimba ndere, Nembi nde, Nizama rape kusinga kuyetu. Mashoko hivyo yesu wala nasi, tinu sangana nao, kubaku ziverengwa, zilipano, ziverengwa za tichabata, atisi kuzoverengwa ziverengwa zose, asi tichaverengwa ziverengwa chumweche tichipu babuna Isaiah chapter 53 verses 1 to 5. Kunewa no maka, tinu zoverengwa tiriku zimbai koko, kuna wakorende wakutanga, chapter 1 verse 18 to 25. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 15 through 31. Saka ndi chaverenga mbuku reji, reji rungu, baibi reji rungu, the RSV version, the revised standard version. Isaiah chapter 53, from verses 1 to verse 5. The theme for today is God's redemptive power. Isaiah chapter 53. Regai tisanga ane ipa. Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form of
stripes we are healed. May God bless the reading of his word now and forevermore. Amen. Amawa diwa mutawedwe zwaranas ndi Reverend Dr. Gondonwe and Chatori Nguaya Kareba Tinova Ziwa is our former missions director and the current principal of United Theological College. He comes with him a lot of experience and theological reflection that he's going to give us today from the title of God's redemptive power. May God bless you as we will welcome the man of God. Amen. And so, Maka Tendeka, Jesu, every day, and every hour, you are faithful. You know, Kwasai Mose, Mr. Baba, Nere Monaco Mana, Muro Muyam Treni, I greet you all in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Taungana ne nziri ya tisata kamboita. Sejwa kambu taungwa na presiding bishop. Kuti isuse muri okutenda. We are disconnected from each other and yet we are connected. So the usual has been transformed to become the unusual. As the Shakadaro says also, Maruedu is still our God. Please accompany me as we reflect on the service of crucifixion or the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. I would have loved all the three texts to be read, but for the convenience of our people, we have chosen to read from Isaiah, a very critical text for ourselves. And the central theme, whatever I will be saying this afternoon, revolves around God's redemptive power. So wherever I go, whatever I say, the sender of this message is about the salvific power of God or the redemptive power of God. Few days ago, Some of you might have come across a very sad story. It's a story about a Kenyan captain, a pilot, a distinguished son of Kenya called Captain Dandi Kimuyu Kibati. Captain Kibati flew a Dreamliner 787 from Nairobi, Kenya to New York. His mission was to evacuate hundreds of Kenyans who were trapped in the U.S. on the account of coronavirus. This was possibly the last flight before international flights were banned and airports closed. But he was asked by his government to set out on a rescue mission. The risk of flying to New York was obvious at this particular time. Firstly, the flight would have been refused landing as world events were changing very, very fast. Secondly, he risked contracting the virus itself. But fully aware 
of these possibilities. Captain Kibati set out for New York on a mission. He was allowed to land and accomplish his mission in New York, but upon his return, he went into quarantine in a local hotel. And a few days later, he tested positive to the virus. And subsequently, he died. And at his funeral, the representative of the Kenyan government described Captain Kibati as a man who paid the ultimate sacrifice for Kenya. And he says, and I quote, Kenyans owe him a great deal. The whole concept is how Captain Kibati chose to fly to New York at the risk of his own death. It's not that he didn't know, neither was he ignorant, but he cared for hundreds of thousands, hundreds of people trapped in the U.S. who were facing a possibility of death. And he decided to substitute the death of many people with his own death, and for this, Kenyans owe him a great deal. In the same vein, when we gather for Easter, we celebrate a man who substituted the death of the entire created order with his own death. Crucifixion was a widespread way of killing. It started with the Phoenicians, adopted by the Greeks, and lastly the Romans. Jesus Christ exercised his ministry during the reign of the Romans. And among us, the Phoenicians and the Greeks, only people who were non citizens were subjected to this barbaric killing. Not everyone, no matter the crime, would be crucified. But the Romans transformed this kind of understanding and they extended crucifixion to army officers or army personnel that were rebellious. If you are in the army and you rebel, you will be killed by crucifixion. And as a matter of law, it was a kind of killing that was reserved for non-Roman citizens. It was also reserved for the law class. It was a kind of death for those without names. It was a kind of death for those who were found guilty of treason. It was a kind of death for the foreigners. It was a kind of death for the slaves. It was a kind of death for second class citizens and those who threatened social order in an establishment. Of course, the aim of such killing was to deter others. The main aim was to torture victims. Before you are crucified, you are tortured to the extreme. For instance, a person would spend a week in agony, hanging on a cross until that person dies, perhaps through hunger, in some cases through bleeding, in some cases through other various, but the whole concept, and in terms of how long a person would spend before dying, would depend on personal strength of an individual. 
The other reason for this way of killing was to shame somebody. Apart from exerting pain on individual, you needed to be shamed for your actions. If you are an army rebel, you needed to be shamed by the whole world. This whole practice of shaming people was carried over in many places and for generations after. In the UK, for instance, some of you know the Transfalgar Square, which was known as the laughing stock where criminals and those people who have been uh, convicted of various crimes will be paraded for the masses to come and laugh at them. This is why it was called a laughing stock. The whole concept was to exert shame on an individual. This kind of killing reflects human cruelty and human bestiality. It demonstrated the callousness of humanity. It really showed that human beings can be animals who rejoice at the suffering of others. This is exposing the bestiality nature of humankind. But for our Lord Jesus Christ, the trouble started early in his ministry. And I'm not going to trace the trouble from where it really began. You remember as early as when he was 12 years, he remained in the temple and teaching. But things consolidated and reached a crescendo pitch when he entered into Jerusalem in, in what is commonly known now in the Christian calendar as the triumphant entry. When he entered into Jerusalem in the triumphant entry, the authorities were or were disturbed to the core. When he later claims the temple, he just ignited the fire. The chief priests, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and even the Roman authorities were very, very much concerned with his popularity, particularly his ability to arouse popular feelings among the population. For several times, they tried to kill him. And they wanted to kill him extrajudicial. When he fed 5,000, the, the animosity just increased. They were looking for an opportunity to, to kill him. How can we get to this young man who have set the entire Palestine upside down? They wanted to kill him. But for them, the reasons for killing him were very political. And when they eventually seized him, of course, they arrested him and took him to judicial authorities who tried him and found him not to be guilty. You will remember that he was pushed from pillar to post at some point, he went to the chief priest, at some point he went to Herod, at some point he went to Pilate, back to Herod, who can say, it? I don't have jurisdiction, I don't have jurisdiction to try this man, he was sent back to Pilate, and Pilate tried him and found him to be innocent. But, even when he found him to be innocent, he subjected our Lord to mob justice. He says, I don't see anything criminal about this thing. But since you demand that I release Barabbas for you and you want to 
kill you. Do as you wish. Yes, Jesus was immediately sentenced to death by crucifixion. This kind of killing, as I have said, was dehumanizing. It was degrading. Just to, to give you a picture of what was happening. Cicero, one of the church historians, in one of his writings, condemned this kind of death by saying, this is the most cruel and disgusting punishment. Early Christians were ridiculed a great deal. Wherever they go, they will be ridiculed by the masses and they will say, so your savior died on the cross? You call him your savior? You call him your master? You call him your God? And yet he died on the cross. There is a graphic that existed in the second century, discovered on a Palatine Hill in Rome. And this graphite, this graphite shows a man who was stretched on the cross with a, 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 a donkey's head. The man did not have a human head. The head was a donkey. It's a graphite. When we talk of a graphite, we are talking of drawings by ordinary people, which is an instrument of history. It demonstrates the thinking of people at that particular time. And in the second century, this graphite showed a man hanging on the cross, symbolizing Christ, but they removed a human head and put a donkey's head to say any person who dies on the cross is as good as a donkey. Yes. The death was inhuman. The cruelty, the cruelty of this kind of death had never been experienced in world history. And of course, Paul writing to the Corinthians in the text that we didn't read, he engages them and to the Romans, he says, for the Romans to die on the cross means criminality. If you are a criminal, then you are sentenced to die on the cross. And for the Greeks, if you are sentenced to die on the cross, it shows your foolishness. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, he says it's criminality to the Romans. And it is foolishness and a sign of weakness to the Greeks and obviously to the Jews it's a curse for the Jews you wouldn't be hanged on a tree because it's a sign of a curse Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse 23 says cursed is he who hangs on a tree and there was no distinction between dying on a tree and dying on a cross so for Jesus to die on a cross he was like a cursed man. So, there was unanimity amongst these constituencies. For the Romans, it's criminal criminality. You die on the cross because you are a criminal par excellence. You are not just an ordinary criminal to be killed on the cross. And for the Greeks, you die on the cross because you are foolish. You have engaged in foolish acts. For the Greeks, you die on the cross because you are weak. For the Greeks, you die on the cross because you are immoral. So either way, for the Romans, it's criminality. For the Greeks, it's stupidity multiplied by foolishness. And for the Jews, it's a stumbling block for the Jews because one who dies on the cross is a cursed man. Cursed is he who dies on the cross. So for our Lord Jesus Christ to be subjected to this kind of experience was an enigma for people of no faith. They didn't understand what it really means. It was mysterious. 
But for Paul, he would say, for all those who believe, for all those who believe, the cross is not foolishness, the cross is not criminality, the cross is not a curse, but it is power in which we were saved. For us who believe, it's the power of redemption. It's the power in which we are saved. Is the power that dwells in everyone who claims and who answers to this creed. Whether Methodist or Catholic or Anglican or Lutheran or whatever you are, the identification is your faith and you have this power resident in you. Of course. The journey to crucifixion was very bad. There were four places where people would be crucified. Number one, you would be crucified at a place of crime. Where you committed the crime, you would be crucified. I remember when I was young, my mother would discipline you at the place of crime. Ukaba sugar, waitoro, onoro, wapasa, gare sugar, ipa, 12.5. The other place of crime, the other, the other place that uh, people will be, will be persecuted or crucified was at crossroads. The whole reason for crossroads was publicity. Crossroads, major crossroads in Harare, you would think of Samora and Enterprise, where people converge so that you will be seen by everyone that this man is a criminal, has been sentenced to death by crucifixion. The other place was theater halls. People would gather in theater halls like they were watching a film to come and witness crucifixion. And all those who are full of anger because you have lost your TV to thieves, because you have lost your car at some point, you have lost your handbag, they would converge in a war at a particular day to witness the crucifixion of a criminal. But as it were, when the process began and the excruciating pain of crucifixion is demonstrated, men would just take their beds and leave because it was horrendous. <coughs> The other place of crucifixion was at high places, such as mountains and hills. And our Lord Jesus Christ was persecuted, was crucified on a mountain or in a hill. The reason, again, is publicity. You need to be crucified where everyone would see you, identify you, and shame you, so that you become a laughing stone. Obviously, when these people were sentenced to death, they would be required to travel long distances carrying their own cross to that place of death. And you remember the Jesus story that the cross was so heavy, the distance was long, he had not slept, he had been under a, 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 an unjust judiciary that kept him for long hours. He kept on from chief priest to pilot to Herod, all those things happening. But the whole idea was to make sure that there is publicity about your death. You carry your own cross towards your place of death. And for Jesus, he had to be held by Simon of Cyrene in Africa. The cross was too heavy for him as he staggered along the road, tired, had not ate anything, with all the pain, with all the rights removed. Because once you are sentenced to death, then the rights of a human being are removed. And in many cases, you have your body mutilated. Some of the people who would actually get to the place of crucifixion, they will get there without arms. They will get there without hands. They will get there without toes. 
they will get there without ears because mutilation was allowed. Not only mutilation, they will frog you, they will beat you, they will unclothe you so that you are shamed. The whole idea is to shame you to the maximum. The whole idea is to torture you to the maximum. The whole idea is to dehumanize you so that you cease to become a human being. But the question that begs for an answer, friends, the question that begs for an answer is why would Jesus Christ die such a death? Why would our Messiah, why would one who we call our Lord die such a dehumanizing death? Why would God himself die such a death? He was not foolish. He was not a criminal. He was not cursed. So why would you die a death on the cross? The reason is simple. One reason which is the center of our ministry is that God died on the cross or he sent his son to die such kind of a death because he was in solidarity with human beings. The cause of Jesus' death was that he was in solidarity with humanity. It's not that he could not defend himself. It's not that he was weak. It's not that he could not escape. But he had to die such kind of a death so that he is in solidarity with the human, with the human weaknesses. Friends, there is no way. If you want to think of uh, Bultmann and Hegel, they will tell you that Humanity does whatever it does simply because they are afraid of death. They are running away from death. People amass property, they amass money, they do these things because they are afraid of death. But the more we try to run away from these things, the more we become susceptible. So the only way God would conquer these evils. The only way God would conquer would be to be in solidarity with humanity by dying like a human being, by going through the cross. Philippians chapter 2 says, although he was God, he did not hang on to his godliness, but decided to empty himself. Kinetic theology. The theology of self empty. He decided to empty himself for the sake of the world's salvation. And Jesus wanted to conquer the evil about humanity, the cruelty about humanity, and he decided to die in order to conquer them. He decided to surrender. The cross is a sign of surrendering. When you surrender to a thing, that's the, the only way to conquer the power of that thing. And he decided to die in solidarity with human beings. And what is it that he conquered on the cross? What is it that he died for? What is it? And I am saying, he conquered everything. He conquered everything, every weakness around human beings. But let's demonstrate this by choosing the very few ones which we find at play during his own trial. The frailties of humanity, of humanity that we see at play during his trial, during his death. And let's play around with this. The first one, 
The first one, Jesus Christ died in order to conquer injustice. He was subjected to injustice. He was subjected to extreme injustice. Yes, there is always pain that is accompanied by a broken down system of justice. Jesus is sent to appear before Pilate, Herod, then Pilate, and clearly all of them absolve him of any wrongdoing. But for their expediency, they say, do as you want with him. Injustice. We have so many people in this world who are victims of a broken down system of justice. Some have lost their properties because of injustices. Some have lost custody of their children upon divorce because of injustices. Some have served prison terms in spite of their innocence. Some have been forced to do community service for offenses that they have not done. Some in the villages are forced to pay gods, to pay cattle, to village heads and chiefs in order to escape from certain social responsibilities. Jesus died to vanquish all the powers of injustice. Food in rural areas. It's possible that it can be distributed on the basis of patronage. When there is breakdown of justice, people suffer. To our courts in Zimbabwe and beyond in the region, we say, please dispense justice and nothing more. They opened night court for Jesus to dispense night justice to our Lord Jesus Christ. Our courts are arenas for justice and equity. Our Supreme Court must offer supreme justice not to be the cause for supreme harm. Our ecclesiastical courts are not spared. They must show the way in delivering justice. After the Jesus ordeal, never again should we have people dying through extrajudicial killings. After the horrendous Jesus experience, Never again should we have people presumed guilt before their trial. The presumption of innocence is a well-acclaimed principle of law. Let us all those who hear this, from Zaraban to magnificent prodigious hills in Chimanimani, from the valleys in Chiret to the mountains in Yanga, from the beautiful city of Melbourne in Australia to the populous ghetto in South Africa called Soweto. The nature of Jesus' death is a call of for all of us to review our sense of justice from individual level to the international level. What justice are we dispensing in our own homes? Apartheid in South Africa was a form of injustice. Slavery in the U.S. was a form of injustice. War of liberation in Zimbabwe was inspired by injustice. And to hear people today suggesting that the coronavirus drug, which is on trial, must be administered to Africans, is a justice issue. Churches must be on the forefront to reject such a heresy to reject such parochialism which is informed by extreme ignorance. Pilate's wife whispered to her husband, don't find this man guilty. I didn't sleep. I didn't sleep. God spoke, me, sp spoke to me in a dream and he said, don't find this man guilty. But Pilate decided to ignore his wife because of political expediency. Pilate decided to ignore a matter of justice because of the source of justice. And we say today, the government must listen to us. The government must listen to the church 
But if the church is going to be fruitful, if the church is going to be authentic, it must first be associated with justice itself. The second vice that Jesus Christ died to vanquish is abuse. Jesus Christ was abused. How do you carry your own cross? How do you carry your own cross to a place of crucifixion? How do you have a night justice? How are you refused food? How are you refused bathing? How are you stripped naked? This kind of abuse is too prevalent in today's world. And Jesus' abuse was an abuse to the extreme. We have people today who are traumatized by abuses. In many places, among us, the areas, in Uzumba, we have got victims of rape, some by strangers, but some by close relatives. And we are saying, Jesus Christ died so that all forms of abuse can be vanquished. We have people who work in the cities who have been abused by their bosses in lieu of higher pay. We have seven police officers, prison officers, who have suffered sexual abuse because of the need for promotions. The church is not even spared in this vice. Vatican has recorded a great number of abuse for women, for children. In our own churches, the reverends, the pastors, the priests, the prophets, they are all over in the media abusing people, abusing congregants, and Jesus died on the cross so that no one, absolutely no one, will ever be abused in the same manner. Yes. Yes. The priests do abuse people. The tool that they have used in all this is their alleged spiritual superiority. Every day, in every valley, in every hill, shrine, cave, there is a woman being left. And sometimes by a prophet. We have so many people in South Africa, some in Australia, Canada, US, some in Germany, some in Arara, some in Blauai, and they ask, where is God? Because even as we are talking now, they can relive their experience, their horrendous experience of abuse in the hands of the powerful. When God, where is this kind of abuse going to come to an end? Number three, violence. Jesus Christ died so that all forms of violence, all forms, all forms of violence, whether gender-based violence, whatever psychological violence, emotional violence, physical violence, Jesus Christ suffered violence and he in solidarity entered on the cross in order to deal with these vices once and for all. The church of God is here called upon to shun violence. Our politicians, who pride in violence. We are saying to you, this Easter, this is the time to turn around. This is the time to root think. This is the time to reflect and say, we no longer need violence. We don't want violence in our midst. Yes. In our own families, there are so many people who have been violated who are listening to this sermon with tears running down their cheeks because of the abuses that they have suffered. When you withdraw food from someone, it's violence. Let us all be aware, friends, that God came to rescue us that God entered on the cross to fight 
these vices. He came to fight abuse. He came to fight violence. He came also that he can put paid to our debt. Yes, he paid the debt. He did not owe. The pilot in Kenya, the pilot in Kenya paid the debt. He did not owe. He said, I will go to New York and bring my people. If I die, I die. I will rather substitute my all their own lives with my life. And Jesus Christ did not die for Kenyans alone. He did not die for Zimbabweans alone. He did not die for South Africans alone. He did not die for the United Kingdom people, for Australians, for wherever. But he came to substitute the created order in its totality. May all those who believe say Amen. Christ, Jesus Christ came to substitute you in your position of death. And he said, I would rather die in your place. Captain Kibali is no more. He substituted Kenyans. He had the mind of Christ. He had the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is sacrificial. The mind of Christ is driven by love. The mind of Christ is driven by self-denial. How many of us, how many of us who are stocking millions and millions of food, millions and millions in their accounts, they've got blankets, they've got everything, but people are going around without food when they've got millions in US dollar tax in their accounts. Where is the mind of Christ? They keep these things, but these things will never give them life. It is through self-empty. It is through participating that there is victory. It is through entering the cross that Jesus conquered the cross. There are no two other ways. He had to go through the cross to pay our debt. He did not owe. We owed the debt and he replaced us. Finally, my friends, finally, listen to this carefully. In every atrocity, in every abuse that we have experienced, in every violence that we have experienced, in every vice that we always encounter, even when you have got tears running down, when you reminisce about your experience as a young person, when you reminisce about your experience at home, when you reminisce about your experience in the country, when you reminisce, there is always a day after. When you was crucified on the third day, death was never permanent, but he rose from death, he made victorious, not limited by space and time, but he was now the Lord. All those who go through this abuse, all those who go through this violence, all those who go through this pain, all those who go through this torture, who emerge one day and look at themselves and say, and say, we are victorious. Joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. I exhort you, friends, wherever you are, to take stock of your own life, to revisit your sense of justice, to revisit the abuses that you have directed to other people, to take stock of how we have related to not only our friends, but even to those who don't like us. No matter what, we have a common destiny. We may give each other names. In Rwanda, they say others are cockroaches. 
But the bottom line is that they are all human beings. In this country, we may talk of each other as a man jury, or as Makoni, as MDC Kupe, as MDC Changirai, as Alliance, as Zan PF. It doesn't matter. We have a common origin and a common destiny. Let's take care of each other. We are tired of hearing these slogans. Pasna Niki, Pasna Niki, Maukum Denga, Maukum Denga, Maukum Denga, Maukum Tangeta Nazo. We are Christians. Let's try now, friends. Our victory is in love. Let's love one another. Let's be our brother's keeper. May the good Lord, we have called you from the web, make you new even after this Easter. In whatever pain, in whatever situation you are, in whatever experience, just know that joy comes in the morning, it shall come to pass as our Lord Jesus Christ resurrected in victory. You will emerge victorious even in the abuse that continues. May the Lord, may the Lord of victory bless his church even as we fight this coronavirus. Let's all take heed and stay in our homes. As we fight this coronavirus, let's continue to pray. We are waiting for a day when this thing shall be over, when we are all victorious and we hold hands together in unison, when we pray and sing together, when we pray and sing together. Tijiti, makata kura kuipa Jesu, makata kura kuipa Jesu, kuipa kusikwenyo. Maringa kumborele, maria kupa fadze, maria kusimbise. Tite cheka ukama nas ne injustice, tite cheka ukama nas ne abuse, tite cheka ukama nas ne violence, tite cheka ukama nas ne square ti ne kuti he paid the debt. And remember that there is an after effect. The after effect is our victory. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Sure. 